section of Scripture to, we give, to which we give our attention this evening also gives us in its opening verses the text that will serve us in our devotion. We read from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And here the Apostle Paul encourages us, no matter what we're dealing with in life, suffering, difficulty, hardship, to trust in God's love for us, and God's promise of salvation, keeping our eye fixed on that everlasting goal, no matter what our circumstances on earth might be. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces patient endurance. And patient endurance produces tested character. And tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. It is rare indeed that someone will die for a righteous person. Perhaps someone might actually go so far as to die for a person who has been good to us, to him. But God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, it is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. The next reading reminds us that as we live, Every day, certainly as we close out one year and enter a new year, we want to live not for ourselves, not even for others that we know and love, but for our Lord Jesus Christ who lived for us and who died for us also that we might live forever. We read from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore be imitators of God as his dearly loved children and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But do not let sexual immorality, any kind of impurity or greed, even be mentioned among you as is proper for saints. Obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking are also out of place. Instead, give thanks. Certainly you are aware of this. No immoral, impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ who is God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. It is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, so do not share in what they do. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light <clears throat> consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord and do not participate in fruitful, fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them. And our final portion of scripture this evening comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. Every one of us ought to be prepared for the moment of death whenever that should come for us as Christians. Now for a believer, death is always the gateway to eternal glory. Why? Because Christ died and rose for us. And we are forgiven and through faith in him, we're heaven's heirs. But there is something else that could happen before you or I die. It could happen this evening, tomorrow, at some point in 2021, or many, many years from now. And that is that the Lord will return. In many places in Scripture, God speaks about the imminence of the return of Jesus for judgment. In other words, it could happen any time. 
and he calls on us routinely to be spiritually prepared, reminding us that God alone knows the day or the hour. And so it's up to God's people in faith in his promises, including the promise that judgment will come and deliverance for the church, that you and I be spiritually ready, that we not let our faith lapse, that we never take God's grace for granted. Again, Jesus speaks these words of earnest reminder to us of the importance of being ready for the Lord's return from Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Be like people waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Blessed are those servants whom the master will find watching when he comes. Amen, I tell you. He will dress himself and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. Even if he comes in the second or third watch, they will be blessed if he finds them alert. But know this. If the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. You also... Be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you are not expecting him. Now with this, we end our scripture readings and move on to this evening's sermon hymn. Now thank we all our God, hymn number 610. The word of God on which this evening's meditation is based are the words of Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces patient endurance. And patient endurance produces tested character. And tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And that's God's word. I've been in the ministry for 35 years. I had the opportunity today 
to do something that I guess you could call a milestone. I officiated over my 50th funeral. This one was different and more difficult. A very, very dear friend of mine, the pastor from Faith Lutheran Church in Russellville, Arkansas, Pastor Philip Shereen, suddenly died of a massive heart attack on Christmas afternoon. His family gave me the privilege of performing his funeral. I'd known him for 35 years, and I would say over the last 20 in particular, we'd drawn very close to the point where, well, we would talk to each other by phone three, four times a week about all kinds of things. Phil was my 50th funeral. But 50 funerals was nothing for a man named Martin Rinkert who was a pastor in Ellenburg, Germany in the 1630s. Martin Rinkert didn't perform 50 funerals over the course of his ministry or 50 funerals in a single year. In one day in 1637, Martin Rinkert performed 50 funerals. And then he did it again the next day and the day after that. The year was 1637. He was the only pastor left in Eilenburg, Germany by then. Now this was at the height of what's known by historians as the Thirty Years' War in Germany. It had begun back in 1618. By 1637, one army after another had crisscrossed Germany, devastating the country. The handful of people who survived became refugees, and many of them moved into the walled cities of Germany, like Eilenburg. But those cities couldn't contain the population safely. Famine, pestilence, plague were rampant. And in 1637, Martin Rinkert buried over 5,000 people. There were four pastors at the start of the year serving the congregation and community. One of them, afraid for his life, left his calling for parts unknown. Of the three that stayed, two died from the plague, and Martin buried them. He also buried his wife during that time. And yet during a war that lasted 30 years, a war that would bring such devastation, Martin Rinker back in 1630, seven years earlier, had written these words, Nun danket alle Gott, mit Herz, Mund, and Händen which you and I just sang in English, now thank we all our God, with hearts and hands and voices. That hymn is the embodiment of the words of the Apostle Paul that I read to you just a few moments ago from Romans chapter 5. And granted, by the time 1637 came, I have a feeling that Martin wasn't singing, now thank we all our God, every day easily. He probably struggled to sing those words, to meditate on the poem, the lyrics that he had produced. And yet, because he knew God's word well, he knew what you and I have just heard, that suffering, well, that produces tested endurance. And tested endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope that doesn't disappoint because it keeps our faith, our, our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem that the people of Martin Rinkert's day had, and it's a problem that you and I share, is that when problems come, and they can be small problems like a, a dripping faucet under the sink, or a transmission in a car that begins to slip, 
or a financial problem, a, a job loss, or a broken heart, or an illness that limits us, maybe even costs us a loved one or, or worse, we can have faith that ends up being well, myopic or nearsighted. What we see is the trouble in front of us. We feel the suffering that we're going through. We feel it intensely. We taste defeat and failure and hang our heads. And often during those times, we don't find joy. We can't give thanks. But this is where the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, because after all, these aren't Paul's words alone. These are God's words should speak to each and every one of us. Whether you commit the words of Romans 5, these verses, to memory or not, they ought to be at the ready for every one of us because they speak to the reality of life and to the plan and purpose that God has for us through them. Paul writes, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those words are very important, have been justified. It's a past perfect tense, or pre present perfect tense, pardon me. What it means is God in the past accomplished something and continues to carry out that which he has accomplished into the present and forward into the future. You weren't justified, made right with God because of anything that you did. We confessed earlier in Psalm 90 uh, uh, that, that, that God is our refuge and strength. He's the one that helps us in all of our trouble. We, we can't help ourselves out of our sins because we were conceived and we have been excellent practitioners of sin from the moment of our inception. Indeed, in word and thought, we defy God. We damage others. We dishonor ourselves. And yet God has justified us. What he's done is brought every one of us into his courtroom. And he has declared us not condemned, convicted. He hasn't called us criminals. He has declared us justified, which means right. We are righteous with God. And not because of anything inherent in us. Instinctive, native. God has declared us righteous, not because of anything that we do. Not because we feel bad about our sins or promise to try harder, try better than most. He hasn't declared us righteous because we've been Christians across the course of our lives, as has been the case for nearly all of us. He declares us righteous for only one reason, and that is for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We've been justified because Jesus Christ came into this world to be what you and I cannot be, perfect. And then to credit us with that perfection. It's as though you and I, spiritually speaking, sin-wise, have gone on a spending spree. And we've charged and charged and charged and indebted ourselves to sin so much that there's absolutely no way, pay, way that we can pay our debt. Christ came in and embraced entirely the responsibility for your debt, your sin debt, and my sin debt. And the sin debt of everyone here, of everyone alive today, of everyone who has ever lived from Adam and Eve on, and everyone who will live. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He took responsibility for all of us. And what he did instead was credit us with his holiness. In an amazing act of love and graciousness, God chooses, and, and we want to remember this, God chooses to do this. He doesn't have to do it. He's not obligated. He chooses to look at you, not as you are, but as he wants you to be. And to Jesus Christ, he declares that you are. God sees you not as a sinner. He sees you as utterly sinless. And because of that, 
you have access to heaven because nothing impure or unholy, nothing immoral can enter heaven. Now, what God doesn't do is deny reality. He knows that functionally we are sinners. But what God has done is take the responsibility, the accountability, the damnation that are tied to our sins and lay them all squarely on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. On that cross on Good Friday, the Savior who was perfect for you was punished for you. And so God's wrath wasn't overlooked or winked at. It was fully satisfied. God forsook your sin. God damned you to hell in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he took Christ's holiness and applied it to you. So instead, God looks at you as his son, his daughter, a saint, all of us as heirs of everlasting life in heaven. Now what that should do is give us perspective on the problems that you and I encounter in life. And certainly we've encountered a lot of problems during this past year. We have lost loved ones. We have had financial hardships. We have watched a market go from high to low and bounce back, and who knows where it will go in the year to come. We're going through a political crisis in our country right now. There have been riots in the streets, rivals for the presidency, and while it appears that one has been given the presidency, the contest seems not to be done yet. And the courts might end up, and Congress might end up having to decide. And no matter what the outcome, people are going to be unhappy, even angry. COVID has changed our lives. You're wearing masks this evening. Who would have dreamed a year ago that you could walk into a bank and withdraw money, and all while wearing a mask, and not have a policeman come after you? These masks are miserable. As are the gloves and the hand sanitizer that dries our hands. For our medical professionals, the hazards that they encounter, whether they are paramedics, nurses, or doctors. Taking care of patients, never knowing who does and doesn't have COVID because the test doesn't always show right away whether or not you are ill. And while most don't die of COVID, some do. And the death is not easy. And since none of us, so far as we know, have had COVID to this point, we wonder whether or not that illness might come upon us or our loved ones. It's been an awful year. And the worst may yet to become, or uh, may be yet ahead for us. We don't know what 2021 will bring. What we do know is that no matter how good things are, there will be difficulties as well. Jesus had told his disciples before he left them in the upper room on Monday, Thursday to go to the cross to die for them and us and rise from the grave three days later to defeat death, sin, and Satan. Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will, not you might, you will have trouble. And we know what trouble is. We just don't know what troubles lie ahead. But because we have been justified, we know what ultimately lies ahead for every one of us. And that's everlasting life in heaven. You have been baptized. Baptized with water and the word of God. And in a ceremony so simple, yet so extraordinary, God washed your sins away. God made you a member of his family. God gifted you with faith. And through that word that makes baptism effective, God has sustained your faith over the years. As a young child, as an adolescent, as young adults and middle-aged and older adults, the word works. And it has sustained our faith. At times our faith has wavered. But the word has never let us down, nor has the sacrament that many of us will share this evening. Simple bread and wine. And yet, because God's word is connected to it and the promise of God, 
we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Christ touches us as we receive the sacrament, but more than that, Christ forgives us. Christ fortifies our faith, reassuring us that we are justified before him, that we have something ahead beyond all of the pain and the problems, the sufferings, the sickness, the sadness, the sin of others and our own. We have something ahead of us that nothing in all of the world can buy, but no one and nothing can take from us either because God has guaranteed it to us. God has guaranteed us everlasting life in heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to believe that. Now, as the Thirty Years' War lingered on, even a peace treaty, and one finally was signed, would not bring back to Martin Rinkert, the author of Now Thank We All Our God, his friends, his co-workers, his wife, the thousands in his congregation that died during the year 1637 or the years before or after. But even in his darkest days, and this is something that you and I ought to take to heart, through faith in Jesus, he had hope. Hope that guaranteed by God would never disappoint him the hope of everlasting life in heaven, and the promise that even here on earth, in all things, God would work for his good as he works for ours. You have that hope too in Jesus Christ. Maybe our sadness and our despair, our, our, our frustrations and our fears and our worries come upon us because at times you and I place too much hope in our health and in the people that we depend on, on our finances, and on other aspects of life that make life worth living. When we put our hope too much in the material, we aren't that different from unbelievers because they also can find joy and be grateful when things go well. But, but when things go hard and bad, when everything else gets peeled away or pried away from us, the one thing that remains, in fact, remains even more brilliantly is the hope that you and I have in Christ, the hope of heaven. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces patient endurance. And patient endurance produces tested character. Contested character produces hope. And hope will not be put to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We didn't invite the Spirit in. The Spirit came. God gave that Spirit to us. God has brought us to faith. Not so that we can be happy all of the time in life in a giddy kind of way but so that we can find joy and thanks every day in the spiritual blessings that God gives us, the promise of never-ending mercy. As fire drives out the impurities of iron and tempers it to become even stronger and better, so perseverance, troubles, trials, character are developed in us and our faith grows stronger as we focus more on Jesus Christ. That's why Paul can say our, our hope doesn't disappoint us because we know that having been justified, declared righteous with God, heaven is our home, our, our salvation is certain. And we have the assurance that the God who in his grace has given us what we need the most, everlasting life through faith in Christ, will take care of all of our other needs in this life because he has guaranteed us a life to come in heaven. In 1648, something called the Peace of Westphalia was achieved. The Thirty Years' War ended. And you know what they did as the peace treaty was signed? 
the people in Germany that were gathered there at Westphalia sang the same song that you and I sang before this sermon began to the same melody that we used. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. When your earthly warfare and mine is ended and one day it will be maybe this year with only a few hours left, maybe next year. But certainly somewhere down the road, either because God will call us from this life through the sweet sleep of a believer's death, or the Lord Jesus Christ will return to deliver his church, which means he will deliver you and me. Whenever that day comes, you and I will sing with joy as we can sing this evening and every day. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things have done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has kept us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. We can sing that because you have been justified. The most important thing has been done by God for you. Your soul has been saved through Jesus Christ. And so as 2020 comes to an end, as 2021 is about to begin, this evening, tomorrow, every day, because you have been justified, because you are right with God, because your soul's salvation is certain in heaven, you can sing with gratitude in your heart and absolute confidence. Now thank we all our God. May God grant you a joyous end to 2020 and a joyful beginning to 2021. Amen. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus, amen. Ordinarily at this point we would gather an offering, but with the COVID situation being what it is, passing an offering plate is not a prudent thing to do. We have, though, left offering plates by the exit doors, and if you should choose, you certainly are welcome to give an offering to your Lord through this ministry that we will use to carry out his work of proclaiming the word and serving souls like your own. For those of you who are watching online because you can't be here with us to place your offering in that offering plate, you can give an offering on our webpage, www.gracelutheranwa.com, through our giving button, or you can send an offering to this congregation's mailbox at 415 North 6th Place, Lowell, Arkansas, 72745. But what we can all offer right now is our hearts and our hands and our voices in prayer to the Lord. And so I invite you to rise and join me as we do that now. O oh, Holy Trinity, we thank you for the many blessings that we have received during this year swiftly drawing to a close. Behind us lies the path that our lives have traveled, the path scarred by sin and failure, troubles, frustrations, and suffering. But with your help, we have endured. By your grace, our sins found forgiveness. Through your love, we receive countless good things to cheer our hearts, because you have guaranteed us that in all things, you work for the good of those who love you. And we do love you. Ahead stretches a new year, unknown to us, but well known to you. We will not travel it in fear. We will go forward in faith with the confidence that you are always with us, that you will guide the affairs of our lives to bless us from an earthly and an everlasting perspective. Keep every one of us in your grace, continually under your care. Turn our sorrows to rejoicing. Give us help in all time of trouble, healing for our ills, protection from danger, support in hardship, success in all endeavors. According to your good pleasure, bless our families with good health, impart strength to the weak, and relieve those who suffer. 
May our unresolved problems of the past this year find a speedy solution, a solution which you hold in your gracious hands. Dear God, it's of even greater importance that we commend to you our spiritual needs. Therefore, we seek shelter also for our souls under the comforting umbrella of your mercy. Ease our burden of sin with the forgiveness won by Jesus. And as we grow older, make our faith and our love for you even stronger. Equip us to turn away from every temptation and to do everything that pleases you. Make us diligent students of your word and grant us guidance and comfort from it in our daily lives. Give us your grace to correct our sin, to humble us and chastise us where we need to be humbled and chastised. Fill us with patience. Help us to pray with confidence. Fill us with the fire of love for you and others. And grant us all the trust to look to you always with the confidence that in everything you care for every one of us. May all that we do in this new year and throughout our lives be done for you. And let us enjoy your continued blessings, not only today, but for all of our tomorrows and into forever. Whether we live or die, let us glorify you, for we are your own, redeemed with your Son's blood. It is in his name that we offer this prayer and continue now by praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us now examine ourselves in preparation for receiving this sacrament of our Lord. As the inspired Apostle Paul so instructs us in 1 Corinthians 11, where he writes, Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself accordingly. Are you sincerely sorry for your sins and determined with God's help to change your sinful ways? Yes, I am sorry for my sins and desire to serve Jesus and not a sinful lifestyle. Do you believe that here in the Lord's Supper you will receive along with the bread and wine the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe that I will be receiving the true body and blood of my Lord and Savior which was given into death for my sins. Are you coming to the Lord's table as one in the faith with this Christian congregation, as the scriptures teach? Yes, I have studied the teachings of this congregation concerning God's word. I agree with them and am one in the faith with them as the scriptures command me to be before I come to the Lord's table with anyone. Finally, do you recognize your need for forgiveness? And do you believe that you will receive to the Lord's Supper the full and free forgiveness of all your sins? Yes, I have examined my life, see the need for God's forgiveness, and believe that I will receive the complete forgiveness for all my sins, as my Savior has promised, having examined yourselves and confessed your sins. Come now with confidence and joy to your Lord's table and receive here 
through his body and blood the guarantee that your sins are all forgiven and that eternal life and salvation are surely yours. Please take your seats. We now invite those of you who are confirmed and communicant members of this congregation or one of our Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod or Evangelical Lutheran Synod congregations to come forward and here before our Lord's altar to receive together with the bread and the wine the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness and salvation of all who commune, of all who are here indeed, given for the forgiveness and the salvation of the entire world. Please come forward, for all things are now prepared. <laughs> 